and choose Hebrew. אם אתם מחפשים תרגום לעברית, נא ללחוץ על הגלובוס למטה ולבחור עברית. So thank you all for joining us. What an incredible ceremony, so moving, so many emotions, so many feelings and, and thoughts, so many wonderful speakers. I can't believe it's been 17 ceremonies. And today in this breakout room, um, we have two members of the Parent Circle Families Forum, the Bereaved Israelis and Palestinians for Peace, which is one of the organizations that um, co-hosts the, the joint Memorial Day ceremony every year together with Combatants for Peace. Combatants for Peace, which did an incredible job at um, organizing the ceremony as they do every year. We are so grateful. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to let our speakers um, get into it and, and to share their stories. So we have an opportunity to hear from two incredible women today, Laila Sheikh, um, who is from Bethlehem area. She lost her son, Husai. She is a bereaved mother. She is active both in Combatants for Peace and at the Parent Circle. And we have Tan Kfil Shul, who lost her sister. She's a bereaved sister. I'm also a member of the Parent Circle. She lives in Jerusalem with her family. And Tal, we are so grateful to have you here and Lila as well. Um, Lila, I think we, we'd like you to go first, if you're willing. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk before. So I think um, each of you will have about 10 minutes to share your stories and then we'll open to questions and answers. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Lila, it's good to see you. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity tonight to, to share with you our uh, personal stories after the ceremony. Uh, my name is Lila Sheikh, I'm from Bethlehem. I was born and raised in Jordan because my parents are originally from Bethlehem. But when my father decided to went to Jordan to be a teacher for the refugees there, uh, after he went there in 1967, the war was started. And after that, uh, the Israeli government took a decision to close the border. So my parents lost their citizenship as um, Palestinian and they become Jordanian. Um, my childhood was so normal. Maybe the, the only unique thing that my father was always speak about Palestine and about uh, his relative, uh, his places, uh, about his uh, house, everything's here. So because my, I love my father so much and I love Palestine because of what my father was talking about. So I finished my study in captain business. And then after that, I met my husband in Jordan. In 1999, I came back to Bethlehem to, to get married. Uh, it was for me like a dream come true because for every Palestinian who born outside Palestine, it's like a dream come true. And I was really so happy to be here and everything was perfect. And after one year, we have our first daughter and become much happier because we start to have our own family. And fortunately, after that, after two months, the second uprising was started. And during that time, the Israeli government took a decision not to give the people like me who came from Jordan or other country a Palestinian ID. So because of that, I should stay at home most of the time. But I doesn't care too much because I have my family to take care of. Uh, after uh, a second year, we have our second son. He was a boy. We named him Kusai. And we become much happier because we have um, a new member in, in our family and our family will be bigger. But unfortunately, this happiness was ended to um, 2002, 11th of April, four o'clock in the morning, when our son, at that time he became six months old, he um, woke up in very critical condition because at that time, um, at that night, sorry, uh, the Israeli soldiers came to our village, they threw tear gas and he smelled some of it. And because the, the treatment in our village wasn't good enough, we, so we tried to take him to a hospital inside Bethlehem, but the Israeli soldiers prevented us. They said it's a military zone. 
So the next chance was to take him to Hebron, the next city to Bethlehem. But again, they said that the main road was closed. So we took a road between villages and it was rough and long. And again, for the third time, we faced another Israeli checkpoint. They stopped us, they searched the car, they searched the ID of my husband and my father-in-law. And then they asked us to stop. And they stopped us more than four hours. We tried to explain for them that we should be in a hospital as soon as possible, but they didn't listen. And um, I, at that time, I was thinking to take a risk, and that risk, if they didn't, if they find that I didn't have my Palestinian ID, maybe they will send me to jail or send me back to Jordan. At that time, I wasn't care too much because I have my um, my uh, son to take care of and to think about him. So I went to talk to them, and again, they refused. So they stopped us more than four hours. And after that, when we reached the hospital, the doctor said it's too late uh, for him. And if he will stay alive after 48 hours, he will be handicapped. Immediately, they put him in the intensive unit care because his uh, condition become much worse and worse. Um, at the end of that day, he was died, and that was destroyed me, destroyed our family, destroyed our life. Uh, I was really so angry, full of hatred, anger against all the Israelis, because for me, all of them were responsible about his death. Yeah, I wasn't think to take revenge, because revenge for me will never bring anything back. So during those years I was trying to protect my family and try to, to let them be away from this cycle of violence. Uh, at that time I was uh, take a decision that I don't wanna have any kind of relationship with any Israeli person until I met one of my friends. Um, he was participate with one of project in the Baron Circle Family Forum. And then he tried to convince me about that. And, um, in the beginning, I was refused until one day he invited me to a conference in Bethlehem. And that conference, I was really shocked and amazed when I heard for the first time the stories of the Israelis and how they lost their beloved ones. And for the first time, I looked to them as a human like me. For the first time, I feel that we share the same pain, we share the same tears, and that's what make us so close together, even if we have different circumstances. From that day, I was um, decided to be a member of the forum. And um, then um, in one activity, uh, we were gathered with Israeli and for the first time, they asked us uh, to talk about something happening during the conflict. Uh, so it was the first time I spoke about my son and what happened to him. Uh, and that was so hard for me, even after 16 years, because that was the first time I spoke about him after his death, because even between me and my husband, we didn't spoke. So um, it was like to open the wound again, bring the memories, the pain, the anger, everything back. And um, I was stopped in the middle of the story. And then an Israeli woman came and she sat in front of me and she started to apologize. And she said, yeah, I didn't hurt you, but I know that the people who hurt you from my own people, I'm a mother too. I could understand your pain. I could understand even the word that you think about, but you couldn't say. And she came and hugged me and she started to cry. And her word for me at that time, like um, light comes from dark and deep place, open my heart, open my mind again to, to rethink and to understand a lot of things happen around me. From that moment, I decide to be a member in the forum, start to give lectures inside Israel, Palestine, even around the world to spread the message of peace and reconciliation. And during that journey, I started to discover that it's so easy to talk to people about peace and reconciliation, but the most important thing to really feel it from your inside, because if you didn't uh, feel it from your heart, you will never, or you couldn't achieve anything. Um, at that night of the death of my son, I was having a dream that there's a white dog came and stand on my shoulder and said to me, 
mama, don't cry. I'm so happy. Yeah, I couldn't stop crying from that moment until now. But after I become peace activist, I start to realize that when God sent that message for me, um, and he sent him like a white dove that God wants me to be in this position. And he chose this um, mission for me uh, to not let the death of my son gone without a reason or without achieving something. So I want not just to protect myself or just my family. I want to protect all the people that I could save their life. I don't want them to be part of the cycle of violence because the most terrible thing could happen to any person is lost one of his beloved ones and no other thing could be much more um, hard for him. So um, during this journey, I learned a lot about the Israelis and even I start to know some things I wasn't know about myself and start to rethink about something like, I start to rethink about forgiveness and some people think when I speak about forgiveness, that meant that I, uh, I will forget my son and I will forget his story. But for me, forgiveness is to let the, the hatred and the anger away and don't think about them anymore. Even if I still feel uh, sad when I remember him, but I have something um, so important to do. I have mission to do, to try to, to put my hands with my partners, the Israeli partners, to try to achieve peace, not just for us, for our children and our grand grandchildren, and to give them a better life than the one that we have. Thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna give it now to tell. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lila. Thank you. I agree with you that it's the most terrible thing that could happen to lose someone that you love. And thank you for sharing your story, not only your story, but your hope with us today. Tal, are you ready now? I'd love to hear from you. So hello, everyone. Um, I'll start with an apology. There are a few, um, several uh, familiar names and faces I see here. So my English, which is not great to begin with, will be even shakier, I think. So um, my name is Tal. I live in Jerusalem uh, with my wife and five children. I'm 44 years old and I'm a member of the forum for the last um, 19 years almost. Uh, I was born in Ashkelon to my parents. I was, I am their eldest daughter. And my sister Yael was born four and a half years after me. We both grew up in Ashkelon, went to art school uh, and uh, finished our high school Yael in Ashkelon and me in Jerusalem. And uh, when I finished my army service, I went to the Bezalel Academy of Art and Design and uh, moved to live in Jerusalem. That was in 2002. Yael uh, was then finishing her, her high school uh, studies in Ashkelon, in the art school in uh, Ashkelon. And uh, later when she was 18, she joined the army, the IDF, uh, to, do, to the communication corps. She was an officer there, um, teaching officer, I'm not sure how to say it in English. Um, and she liked her service. She used the time also to learn in the open university and do many other things. And one day in uh, September 2003, Yael was on her way home. Uh, it was the middle of the week, it was a Tuesday, which was not uh, her usually, her usual 
uh, leaving her uh, base, but uh, she had something to do in Ashkelon and she waited in the bus stop near the Tsrifin army base. A young man came out of a car, uh, stood behind Yael and some, some of her friends and blew himself up. Yael was killed immediately, uh, along with eight other young men and women. And uh, that was the end of my life as I knew it then. I was then in Jerusalem working in the Khan Theater in the box office. And on the TV screen, on the TV set we had in the box office, I saw there was an explosion. There was a suicide attack near the Trifin army base. I called Yael and she didn't answer my phone. And I called my parents. And we all agreed that it's very normal that she's not answering us. I mean, she's in the base. There was an attack very close to the gates of the base. She's probably very busy. That's why she's not answering our phone, our call. And a few hours uh, went by. I left my workplace and went home. And during that time, I tried calling her again and again, and still there was no answer. And at some point, around 7 p.m., my father called me and he said, please come home. And I said, don't you want to tell me to which hospital should I go? And he said, no, just come home. It was the fastest time I was, I arrived from Jerusalem to Ashkelon. I wasn't driving, my partner was driving. And for many, many years after that night, I couldn't sit next to the driver. Every time we had to go from Jerusalem to Ashkelon, I couldn't do the, the way the same way I did that night. I had to drive. It gave me some uh, sort of uh, an illusion of uh, something. So that evening we arrived to Ashkelon and many, many people were there already when I arrived. And many, many people kept coming in the next seven days after Yael's funeral, after um, I remember waking up that morning and for uh, the shortest second, I didn't remember that she was dead. And after that second, it just blew in my face. I'm sorry for the cheap uh, expression, but it was, I can't not remember it. And the seven days of the Shiva went by and thousands of people went through our house, visiting us, comforting us, telling us stories about Yael. We knew stories that we didn't know. And after these seven days of the Shiva, it was um, like, I mean, everyone else went back to their lives, right? And we were there and the house was empty and it was like there is no oxygen in it. We were very much alone. And Still, we wanted to thank all the thousands of people who came to our house during these days. And um, we posted an ad 
in the newspapers telling thanks. And we signed this ad saying, peace will be our, our comfort. Uh, and that ad brought a woman to, to, write, to write my father, actually, to write him a letter and asking him his permission to call him. And he talked to this woman and she invited him to join the, the Parents Circles Families Forum. And I remember him telling me about this uh, story and telling me, he told her, are you crazy? You know, why I posted this ad in the newspaper. How come, how, how come you think I can sit, I can talk to, to these people? And she was clever enough to tell him, I don't, you don't necessarily need to talk, but I invite you to listen. And he went to a, to a weekend seminar uh, after which he invited me to join another a meeting like this, another seminar like this, which was the first time um, for me to meet Palestinian people. Until that point, I was uh, 20 something. I have never met a Palestinian person in my life. And in this meeting, in this seminar, uh, I remember there were uh, circles and people were telling their stories. And I remember myself not talking, listening, and hearing the same story again and again and again. Different details, different names, different locations, and different sorts of deaths. But altogether, these were the same stories. And um, from that point, I realized, I think, that I can't, um, I don't want anyone I know to be in the same position that I am at. Um, meaning, I thought, what, what can I do to prevent other people from going through this hell? Um, and uh, one of the options was to start talking to people. And the forum gave me the opportunity to become a speaker in high schools uh, and in meetings quite similar to this one that we are having tonight. When we were going together, a Palestinian member and an Israeli member to tell our story and to invite people to, to listen and to try to understand the other side of the story. To, able, to, be, to be able to sympathize with someone that they would have never uh, met uh, in any other circumstances. And I did it for a while. And I must tell you, I did it uh, too often because after a while I felt I couldn't do it anymore. I mean, when I joined the forum, I was like, okay, I'm here. We can start the piece now. No one else should do this again. We will just tell people they shouldn't be here and they will understand. Well, that didn't happen. Um, and for a while I was unable to do these meetings anymore. I felt uh, like no matter what I do, it's not enough. And um, I think the change uh, was made for me 
anyway, a few years ago when I realized I can't afford doing nothing. I feel worse when I do nothing. I have to do something. And at that point, it was <laughs> funny or silly to say it was around Hanukkah. And there is this song, Kol Echadu Or Katan. Everyone is a, a tiny candle, a small light. And I remember thinking, it's so stupid, but that, what, that's what made me uh, try to do it again. The realization that um, it's my duty to myself. And as uh, Huda in the ceremony that we just heard said, it's our duty to ourselves, to our children, to our loved ones. We can't afford anyone else that we love to be part of this circle. We can't, we can't let it go on and on without trying to do something. Even if, it, even if it's not the biggest thing, even if it's just sitting here talking to you. So that's what I believe in. I, I believe the young man who killed Yael and her friends, he was so desperate that he was willing to give up his life, his future, um, in order to kill someone else, in order to make a point and killing himself was probably the only solution he could think of, the only way he could see possible. And I can't afford this desperation. I have five kids. I have many people that I love around me and I can't let myself lose hope. I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, we, we had these last few weeks, um, a few incidents of violence here in Israel, as well as uh, in Palestine. And um, I found myself again, um, considering whether I allow my daughters to use the bus in Jerusalem which is, I mean, it's not a normal situation. I mean, I remember before Yael was killed, I went, I, I was in Betalel and I, I uh, lived here in uh, Baka and I used the bus sometimes to go uh, to, to, to Betalel. And I was calling my father, I was calling my mother in the morning when I arrived to Betalel to say, hi, how are you? I'm here. But actually what I was saying here was, hey, I didn't die this morning on my way to school. And thinking about my daughters now using the bus or not using the bus, that's not a normal situation for anyone. And we can't, we can't keep on living like this without doing anything. We must do something. So um, before we, I think I've had my 10 minutes. So before we, before we go on to whatever you want to say or ask or share, I want to ask you to do something, to be with the people that you love and to do something in order to keep them safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tal. Thank you for your bravery, and um, you are not a small light. You are a big light for us, and your candle lights all of that, our lights. And you're right, we do have a responsibility now that we've heard you and Lila speak and share your stories. All of us here today have a responsibility to do something, as Tal said. Um, we can open it up for questions. Uh, in the chat, if you have a question, post it in the chat to Christopher and 
and he will send me the questions. And as um, the questions start coming in, I, I just wanna ask you both, you both have spoken at the Memorial Day ceremony. Both of you um, have shared your stories and given remarks at Memorial Day ceremonies. And that's not easy, both as a Palestinian and as an Israeli. So, so why do it, Lila? Why, I mean, for you as a Palestinian to speak at the Israeli Memorial Day ceremony, that can't be an easy thing. Why do you do it? What does it mean to you? For me, it's so important to, um, to show the whole people around the world, not just the Israelis, not just even the Palestinian, that if we are the people who lost their beloved ones, could stand side by side and try to put our effort to do something, to try to uh, make another, um, or to give our children and our grandchildren and even ourselves a new chance and a new life to live like any other people, not just killing each other. We, we have this situation from 74 years. What do we do achieve? We just kill each other. We make our lives miserable for both sides. We didn't want to, to wait until a new one or to lose a new one. We lost, every one of us lost, and this is so hard for any people. But I think um, we didn't want this happen to any other people, not just here in Palestine and Israel, even more maybe around the world, because if we are the people who lost their beloved ones could try to understand each other, try to understand what we what we're gonna do and try to to make peace so this is a message for everyone who have a conflict not just the same conflict that we have maybe other kind of conflict in their countries so maybe this will be like a chance for them to to do the same in their countries to save their families to save the people around them because god give us life to live not just to kill each other thank you Thank you, Lila. Pal, what about you? Well, for me, as I said, uh, it was part of me going back to doing. And I feel um, we have this, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure really how to say it in English, but uh, since we are considered um, leftists and maybe not uh, the best Israelis, that was my, my chance to, to show that this is how I feel. This is how I feel I, sh I should act and hope people can um, sympathize and maybe even follow. I mean, when I was talking in the in the 2020 uh, COVID first COVID uh, ceremony, it was a very strange situation talking to an empty room, to an empty hall. And I remember thinking, this is such a, uh, this is again so uh, very strange to the humankind to be apart for so long, not to meet, not to touch, not to hug. And um, it was a reminder, I, I could use it as a reminder for, for myself and hopefully for others to, um, to remember that we are all the same. I mean, uh, Corona, COVID uh, affected so many people around the world the same way that it was just too easy to miss how alike we are, all of us. So that was my reason. Mm. And, and there's a question coming in about um, how a few questions. First of all, there's a lot of thanks and appreciation for the both of you for your bravery, 
for you know connecting it's not people are recognizing how hard it must be to talk about this painful experience over and over and they're grateful for you for doing that and then there are a number of questions around um, you know, how you are received in your communities, like what kind of reactions are you getting from your families and friends and, and, and people that agree with you and people, and I guess people are interested in the people that don't agree with you as well. Lila? Uh, for me, uh, in the beginning, when my husband know that I will be a member of the Baron Circle or participate in one of, of the project, he really encouraged me because he tried during 16 years to, to try to encourage me to speak to other Israelis because he have a friend and um, he tried to, to explain for me that not all of them the same, but as I maybe mentioned before that sometimes when we feel of hatred and anger, we can't uh, see the reality. We can't understand sometimes what happened around us. And um, then he, when he know that I will be part of the uh, Burn Circle, he started to encourage me and his family too. Uh, because even after the death of my son, I start to have health problem. And then, uh, then they saw that when I uh, start to be a member of the forum, I start to be a new person, something new start to happen to me and to my life. But on the other side, I still have some of my friends who are against that and even my family in Jordan. Uh, Cause once uh, before, before COVID, I went to, um, to Italy with the Paris Circle. But before that, I went to my family in Jordan. Then I sat with my father and he started to say to me, you shouldn't be with them. They're still our enemies. And um, you know, all this kind of words. And then I said to him, I want to ask you two questions. Uh, you know that my son was died. Do you know the story? And he said, no. I told him, you know that I stay in Bethlehem for 11 years, couldn't come back to see you or to be with you because for 11 years, I wasn't having my Palestinian ID. Do you know what happened to my life during these 11 years? And he said, no. So I told him, how could you judge me? How could you ask him what to do or not to do? This is my life. And I'm the only one who was lost. And I'm the only one who should uh, find the way that I, I think it's uh, the best for me. So please don't judge me. This is my life. And this is what I want to do, not just for me, even for my family to, to take care of them, to protect them. I did not want to lose any, any one of them. I lost one of them and that was much more than enough for me. And then he said, okay, if you think this is the right way to do it, it's okay for me, even if I still like not convinced, but if you think this is the best for you, it's okay. Um, I was really shocked because that was the first time I spoke to my father like that. And he was shocked because um, no one of us was arguing and tried to talk to him about this like that. And he said to me, when you start to talk, I start to find and see the power in your eyes and in your in your voice. I wasn't heard that before. And I think that you become a new person, you have courage and you have um, a power to talk, not like uh, before. Paul, what about you? Well, um... I'm very fortunate to have my, both my immediate family and uh, uh, wider circles around me accepting my way and uh, going together with, with me in this way. But I guess that's not <laughs> what the question is about, uh, but uh, about uh, people who disagree with me. And uh, I have a few friends, not many, uh, a few friends who um, like when I said, when I told one of them, uh, a few of the stories are, I heard from the Palestinian side uh, in the families forum, she said, that can't be true. Jews 
don't just kill Arabs for fun or for no reason. And I said, well, it happens just as it may happen the other way. And um, I'm happy to say she was not, she was not convinced on the spot, but she was willing to listen. And I hope at some point uh, with this particular person, we will be able to, to have this conversation, not just um, between the two of us, but with a Palestinian friend or with a, or maybe not, not even with me uh, when, when she feels like she should protect me or protect my side, but maybe in one of the forums uh, projects, uh, maybe the narrative project or something else, we, maybe we should talk about that too. The, the forum has uh, many, many activities, most of which are educational and uh, are meant for high school students and for groups. Uh, but one very special uh, opportunity, I believe, again, as many people as possible can, should uh, try, is the narrative project. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a project of bringing groups together who have, uh, of, of people who have the, um, uh, um, a specific uh, thing in common. And this thing can be that they are all teachers or they are all architects or they are all women uh, or you get my point. And uh, meeting as a group for uh, several times and learning uh, about the, the narrative of the other side. And it's a precious opportunity to meet, again, people from people that we wouldn't have met in any other way uh, and to listen to them and to tell them our story and to see what happens. That's it. It is a great project. Uh, um, and there are so many projects from the parent circle and combatants for peace and people are asking about, you know, what can they do? How can they help? How can they get involved? Um, <clears throat> First, I mean, you can you can know more now that you are you've heard these stories. You should be liking us on Facebook. You should be signed up for our newsletters. You should come to our activities. There are a bunch of chat uh, links that Christopher is going to post in the chat right now about how to support combatants for peace, how to support the parent circle, um, how to fund the Memorial Day ceremony which is a huge undertaking for both organizations. So please, if you haven't supported the ceremony, please do so. Um, learn more about both of our organizations. If you are based in the US and you are part of a community, whether it's a church or a synagogue, a mosque, a university, invite us, invite Lila and Tal to come speak to your community, be a part of spreading the message. Um, I want to thank Lila and Tal for being with us here tonight. I know it's very late for you, so we're going to let you go to sleep. Um, I want to thank all of you from in our, our the participants for being here with us today. Um, there are so many people in this room, and there were so many great rooms to, to be a part of, so thank you for choosing this one. Um, we look forward to seeing you again next year at the Memorial Day Ceremony. And like Yuli Novak said, I, we also look forward to the day when we think back to the Memorial Day ceremony and the sirens and all that comes to as a distant memory um, that isn't part of our narrative every year. So wishing everybody a good day and a good night and thank you once again. And please look at the links in the chat again. Bye-bye. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Christopher and everyone. Yes, thank you to Christopher and Talia for working the back end of the, of the room today. And to more, our incredible translator, thank you for your interpretation. Um, and thank you all for joining us.